I pray that you bless this message. Pray that you'd honor thy word tonight, Lord, as you always do. I pray that you'd use me as a vessel, Lord, and that you'd help me, Lord, to um, just preach what you've given me and bless the kids as they go back. Please keep them safe as they're in school. Lord, protect their young minds. And, and Lord, I pray that you just keep them physically safe and spiritually protect them as well. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'd like you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. I was praying that the Lord give me something I had. I told you on, on Saturday, I got four sermons. But Wednesday, I like to go just kind of off the cuff of what the Lord has given me uh, close to the, ser the service. I don't know why it is on Wednesday, but the Lord tends to give me something either Monday night maybe Tuesday night, sometimes on my afternoon at work, driving back and forth, I listen to a lot of scripture and I let the Lord speak to me. And I ask him all the time, Lord, please give me something that's you want me to preach tonight for the people. And the Lord never disappoints as far as giving me information and material. Well, you say, well, what did he give you? Well, I was listening to my Bible, and I was just finishing up the book of Romans, and it went on into Corinthians. And when it went on into Corinthians, on the way home from work, I stumbled upon 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I know I've been preaching a lot about holiness, and I think that's been a theme uh, that's been coming out of the pulpit. Uh, it's something that I want to dwell a little bit on. And maybe as the Lord gives me leave, continue to preach on holy behavior and holy living, holy speech, holy dress, holy interaction, holy thoughts. And the list of holy goes on and on and on. There'd be no want for information when it comes to the word holy. But the one thing that stood out to me was 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and then into chapter 6. And as I was listening to it, you know, sometimes when you listen to it, you something will hit you and then you lose the rest. And it's like, oh, I got to go back and listen. And I went back and I listened. Then I went through and I got through chapter six right at the beginning. And I went back and I listened. And I did that repeatedly. And I got a blessing out of it. But the one thing I noticed there in Corinthians was, as I said on Sunday, no one likes a rebuke. Amen. We don't like to be rebuked. But when you read 1 Corinthians and you read 2 Corinthians, don't you see a big difference between the books? What is 2 Corinthians geared towards? For those that really know your Bible, what's the theme of 2 Corinthians? The theme is the ministry. It's the ministry. 1 Corinthians is not the ministry. You'll see a grave difference between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is just lambasting them. And he's all over them. And in fact, in 2 Corinthians, he kind of says somewhat, I'm a little sorry that I made you sad. But though I would repent, I don't repent. Because he knew they needed it. Now, no one in here can say that it's easy to be holy. Amen? Because we live in a world that's not. And the world that we live in has a tendency to brush off on us. Now, 1 Corinthians, and you get to chapter 5, and it begins off with fornication. But yet, it's not just your average type of fornication. How did the Corinthian church get so carnal? This is what we need to ask ourselves. Why did Paul have to deal with them so harshly in his letter? And why were they so carnal? You know, this is the idea of, of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. They were letters. And they were written to the church at that particular city or place. And each of those letters has good and bad about the church that it was written to. Now, you know, Galatians, the Lord 
in Galatians, Paul writes them a letter, and is it a good letter or a bad letter? Well, you might get a blessing out of it, but the Galatian church, whew, they weren't carnal. What were they doing? They were getting legalistic. They were going the opposite direction to the point where it was like they must have become so legalistic in their thinking that they said, we have to run back to the law because this is way too much liberty for us. And there they were disgracing the simple plan of salvation by bringing back circumcision. The, Paul said to them, who hath bewitched you? Corinthians. Philippians. You read Philippians and you say, wow, that was a good church. Philippians chapter 1 through 4. Tremendous chapters, but not so for, for Corinth. But yet the second letter, and here's the thing. They received the rebuke, didn't they? And in fact, the one that this is geared at ends up getting right with God. So the idea is when the message is preached, regardless of who's preaching it or where it's coming from, we have to try it and chew on it. And if that message hits us, we should repent. And if we have things in our life that aren't right, we should not, as they did, get puffed up. The tendency in this day and age is to run back towards Laodicea and become a Laodicean church. And Pastor Jim always said this. He wanted to stand out as the Road to Emmaus Baptist Church as a Philadelphia type church in the midst of Laodicea. So though everybody around you might be Laodicean, it didn't mean that you had to be. Though everybody around you might be carnal, it didn't mean that you had to be. Though everybody around you was embracing the world and running back to Egypt and to all the flesh pots and everything back, it didn't mean that we had to. We could stand out and we could be that lighthouse. But yet it takes all of us. It takes all of us. And it takes an effort from everybody, from everybody to be diligent. First Corinthians chapter five. First Corinthians chapter five, verse number one. Because Satan is out there, and the one thing he wants to do beyond all is he wants to destroy Christians and he wants to destroy the local church. His aim is to get the word of God out of people's hands. His aim is to destroy the local church that Christ died for. His aim is to destroy you as a Christian, and he hunts every one of us. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, what? The devil, what's he do? Walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Will he attack young people differently than he will older folks? Come on. Dave, you were young. And I'm going to point Dave out because in the church, in the church, <laughs> he used to be young, then he got married, he said. How long have you been saved? Since 1970, he's been saved. Okay, he's been saved a long time. He got saved as a young man. In his early 20s, he got saved. So Dave, when he got saved, the devil came at him in a different way than the devil would come at him now. Now, Dave can look back and he say, well, you know what he used to do to me? He can't get away with that anymore because, you know, I'm kind of, as the Bible says, you get your senses exercised to discern. You understand how the devil comes at you. But sometime he'll use a different thing when you get older. And the, I'm going to go there and show you that young women, young men, old, older men, elderly women. <laughs> The devil comes at us in all kinds of different ways. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Now, when you're thinking that's his mother, it's his, it would be his stepmother, okay? In this particular case, he committed fornication with his stepmother. And... 
In fact, in verse two, instead of them mourning about it, they get puffed up over it. Now, the Bible says this, they that sin before, they that sin rebuke before all, right? So that others may what? They that sin rebuke before all so that others may fear. I don't know if you know that verse. Because here's another verse. This is why the crime problem is so bad in the world today. And Donnie, you can attest to this. You've been in court. You've seen a lot as a policeman, police officer. Austin, probably. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Okay? When judgment doesn't come down on a criminal speedily and swiftly and decisively, what happens? Why is crime so bad? If they would just follow one verse of the scripture, crime would stop. This is how powerful the Bible is. You say, Pastor, quote that whole verse so I can get it. Okay. If our country would follow this one verse, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. God says, if you'll do it quickly, decisively, and sentence bring sentence against that evil work, others will fear and crime will stop. But be, when it's not done, the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in themselves to do evil. I can get away with it, therefore I will do it. There are things called laws. There are things called rules. There are things called standards. They weren't living these standards. It doesn't say how this got so bad and why this all occurred. But in the Corinthian church, they were permitting it. And instead of mourning and praying about this particular thing, they were puffed up over it. Paul got wind of it. and He said, what are you doing? Take care of this thing. And this was not an unsaved man. If you read, and that's what I kept on going over, and I, I said, I got to hear, I got it more. These are believers. All of us need to be diligent. We need to make sure who doesn't come in here. He wants to get through that door in the worst way. He has tried ever since we started this church. He has tried to bust this church up. He has tried to destroy this work. We can't let it. And those that are saved, which we have many that are saved for a long time, need to be watching, need to be diligent where something isn't right. Pray about it. To get the opportunity to speak about it, speak about it. Diligence, vigilance, those are great words. Okay, it says in verse 2, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. What did Paul say? He said, this is deplorable. And instead of mourning over it and praying over it, you're puffed up. Carnality. Being carnal will cause people to lose their spiritual vision. He says, you should have been praying that this person would have been taken away from you. Paul meant that the Lord would kill him. You say, oh, come on, pastor. What's it say? Let's read. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath, done, hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver, look at this, verse 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What were they supposed to pray? Was this man a brother? 
This was a saved individual who got into some very, very, very strange fornication. And Paul said, you should pray such an one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. See, the flesh is no good. We know that every day we fight this flesh. And every day we look in the mirror and we get up in the morning, we ought to say, hello, enemy. Because it just fights us. It fights, it fights, it fights. The spirit needs to bridle it. And daily, we ought to crucify our flesh. If the flesh is crucified, that means its hands can't move. That means its feet can't move. It's pinned down. You're not going to get me today, flesh. Yes, I am. No, you're not. I'm going to crucify you with Christ. Today, you're not going to get me. I'm going to keep my thoughts in obedience. I'm going to keep my actions in obedience. I'm going to keep my behavior as becometh holiness. All right. So it says in verse 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. And I quoted this on Sunday. And when I saw it in the verse and heard it, I'm like, I already kind of talked about this. The leaven, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? So here you got the big lump of dough. Lorena, you're, you like to cook? She gets that whole lump of dough and her son-in-law says, I want to tell his wife. Ben says, to Kayla, I'm going to play a trick on your mom. I'm going to get her. You see that big pile of dough there? I want to go put yeast in it. Say, oh, that wouldn't be right. Ben, we'd never do anything like that. Son-in-laws never pick on their mother-in-laws in any way like that. So Ben goes over, he gets the leaven and he slips it in there and he just leaves it. And Lorena comes over couple hours later and what happened to that big lump of or that little lump of dough ah! nobody knew it nobody could see it what was the result what did it do to the whole lump a little sin, a little bit of the world, a little carnality, what will it do to us? The chemical reaction occurred. Is there any going back? It's done with. It's ruined, isn't it? A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Okay, now, it says, therefore, uh, purge out, or it says, your glory is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the fast, or the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not the company with fornicators. Now I'll tell you here, as a Christian, we need to be careful who we're palling around with because those that we run with and those that we pal around with can turn us away from God. And this is the lesson here. Paul talks about this. The company you keep ought to be the, what makes you want to be closer to God instead of pulling you away. So tonight, I want you to consider your friends. I want you to consider who you're palling around with tonight. Are they good for you? And I've talked to a lot of you young people in here. I've talked to a lot of you. And I talked to, I talked to Pietro quite a bit. And Pietro and I talk, and he talks about some of, some of the company that he's around, the hockey team and various things like that. And he said, you know, it's just they don't think like me. The kids that I'm around, they don't. They don't want to talk about the things that I want to talk about. They don't, they don't talk the way I do. And he said, Uncle Kevin, it's amazing how much, how much they cuss. It's amazing the things that they talk about. 
how they talk about girls and how they talk about this and that and worldly things. He said, just, he said, it, it's just crazy. And I try to talk to them about the Lord and they just don't want to hear. He's not alone. He's not alone. Our kids just started school. How many of them can go and openly talk about Jesus Christ at school? You say, well, they can, but how many will listen? And how many are of like common faith to them? See, the pressure on us is to conform to the world, not stand up to it. It's easier to go with the flow, isn't it, than it is to stand against it. But he says here, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not, not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So you think about during Paul's time in Corinthians, here, when he's writing this, there must have been a lot of fornicators in the world. There must have been a lot of people who were covetous and extortioners, idolaters. Because he said, if you stay away from all of them, you'll have to go out of the world. But he says this in verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother. Here we go. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. So there's something that happens when you eat with somebody. You, you enter into, the Lord says, when you eat with somebody, you kind of let your guard down. And the Lord says here, through Paul, he wrote this, not to keep company with someone who was a fornicator or a covetous or idolater. Because what you do is when you break fellowship with someone, you send a message to them and say, your lifestyle is no good. Change it, get it right. It says in verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So when you break fellowship with somebody over their behavior, what you do is you leave them in the hands of God. And the Lord deals with them. Now, their judgment was bad. They were carnal. And they made bad judgments. And that'll happen when we become carnal. We'll make bad judgments because we're not spiritual. And when you live a life that's carnal, you don't have God behind you making the decisions. You're always walking after your flesh. That's why we don't want to make decisions in the flesh. I pray all the time that when I preach, I never preach in the flesh. I pray that all the time. I said, Lord, don't let me get in the flesh. Don't let me preach in the flesh. Believe me, if I started to preach in my flesh, I could destroy this work. I want to pray, Lord, as Tommy always prayed, hide Pastor Kevin behind the shadow of the cross. Let us hear from you and not from him. It's worthless if I get in the flesh and I preach at you. If I get angry and all caught up in my own flesh and, and I preach at you, God's not going to use that. Put the flesh aside. Let this Holy Spirit speak through me. And when he does, now, all of a sudden, what happens? That can get down into the heart and deal with the individual. And the individual, this is what preaching does. Preaching convicts. And preaching gets people right. And through the preaching, we manifest God to you and God's will to you. And when you stay in the book, when you read the book, the book can convict you. So therefore, it's like a two-edged sword. You hear the preaching, and then you read it in the book, and you say, well, it's got to be coming from God. Bad judgments. Carnality leads to bad judgment. Chapter 5 was carnality and a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. And because of this, Paul says in chapter 6, you're making bad decisions and poor judgments. You ever wonder in your life why sometimes it just seems like you just maybe aren't making the right choices? Who's ever felt that in life? That there are times that you just feel God's so far away 
and you feel like you're kind of almost blind where you're making these decisions on your own and you're wondering why is everything going bad? Why might that be? Because you're carnal. And the Lord says, if you want to walk after the flesh, then you make your own decision. I'm going to step aside. I'm not going to give you that guidance. What's the Bible say? Ponder what? Ponder the path of your feet. Ponder the path of your feet. There's the path. There's a path. There's a path. Ponder the path of your feet. I got three choices. Which path do I take? You know one of the best ways to get a man right with God? A Christian man? Tell him he's preaching the next sermon. Amen. Amen. I have never in my life seen anyone out of the will of God when they're up here in this pulpit. They will get everything in their life right. Everything. They'll uncover every rock. Their house will clean up. Their family will clean up. Their life will clean up. I'm preaching. What? Because they understand. I can't get up there. If God's not behind me. So why don't we live this week. Men. Like you're preaching Sunday. Maybe I should call for a round robin. <laughs> That would get the whole church right, wouldn't it? I don't know if I know the recipe for a woman because I can't ask them to get up here and preach. But I do know the Bible recipe for staying right with the Lord, and I'm going to get to it. First Corinthians chapter 6, look, bad judgment, bad judgment. It goes right from this act to the law. Dare any of you having a matter against another? Go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Bad judgment. Somebody once asked me, I think it might have been Samuel. Pastor, is it right for a Christian to take another Christian to court? And I said, that's a toughie, Samuel. And he said, the Bible says, and I said, I know what it says. And I said, I would tend to say it's wrong. And I don't know if a Christian should ever take another Christian to law. Are you not going before someone who might not be a believer? What does God say? Bring it before the church. Got a controversy? Let the church handle it. Christian should be able to go to Christian. See, they were so carnal that even they couldn't go to one another to resolve matters. They had to go before the unjust. Bad judgments. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you not are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not? I think he says that up there again uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, which I just read, know ye not. Didn't he say that there? What's he say again here? Know ye not. He says it again. Know ye not that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? He says it again. Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak this to what? Your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? 
No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Look down there in verse 9. What's he say again? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? What's he say later on down there in verse 15? Know ye not? What was the problem here? They were babes in Christ. They had no understanding. They were carnal. They had no judgment. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall they then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not? I wish I had a dime for every know ye not here. Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not? Here we go again. We're playing some sad music for you. Know ye not that your body, okay, our bodies, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God, what? In your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're supposed to glorify God in our body. Now, the Lord gives us some commands. Turn to First, first Timothy, First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Why don't you go to Titus also? Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. All kinds of things can happen when a church becomes carnal. The walk changes, the talk changes, the dress changes, the actions change. Holiness goes out the window and carnality sets in. And when carnality sets in, all kinds of bad things occur. Titus chapter 2 and verse number 1. As I said the other day, we're in the world, but we shouldn't be of the world. And I preached this two weeks ago when I talked about some of the things I noticed uh, when I was at Kennywood and all the different things that were going on there. And, you know, as the standard of the world goes, the world will have any standard. And I was talking to uh, Ben the other day, Ben Kane, and the kids were going back to school. And he was telling me, he said, Pastor, he said, there is no dress code anymore. The school district that they go to down there, they have totally gotten away from any dress code at all. There is no dress code. They, you know what happened? You know what happened? They used to police it. They used to tell the girls, that's not permitted. Go home. They used to do. They used to tell the boys, that's not permitted. Go home and change. This year, they've decided anything goes. They said when the pockets could be seen underneath of the shorts, sent them home to change. But what happened? What happened? Why all of a sudden is there no dress code? They don't want to fight the battle. They don't want to fight the battle. I'm here to tell you, this church will have a standard. There is a standard here. And when that standard's not met, it has to be addressed. I don't care what the world does. 
I don't care what the standard of the world may be. I'm here to protect you and the sheep that I minister to. Do we want to have no standard? There are people that are sending their kids down to that school district with the expectation that the principal and teachers will take care of these things. It's not being taken care of anymore. It has turned into a free for all. We owe it to one another. And tonight's message came loud and clear to me when I was reading Corinthians. We cannot be a carnal church. We will pay for it. If it's not right, don't wear it. Say, well, the world, this is not the world. This is a place that is supposed to be holy, a place where we worship God. Need we put a stumbling block in somebody else's way? We all have a, a duty. And the Bible talks about this. Titus chapter 2. But speak the things... The Lord said, say it. Didn't he? What did he say? Speak the things which become sound doctrine that the aged men, how many of those we have here? <laughs> the aged men be sober. Given to wine? Stop it. Grave. Temperate. Sound in faith. In charity. Has the Lord blessed you with money? Help others with it. In patience. Boy, that's a tough one for older men. You see, as I said at the beginning of this, when you're young, you fight certain battles. And when you're old, you don't anymore. They change. When you're younger, you fight a lot of the world. When you get older, you realize the world has lost its luster. But now you got to fight some internal things. That's what happens when you get older. I'm getting it. I understand it. I got to fight myself. You ever hear Grumpy Old Men? Didn't they make a couple movies about that? Grumpy Old Men 1, Grumpy Old... I didn't watch, but I don't know how many there were, but they probably could stop at Grumpy Old Men 84 and probably continue to make it because men get old and grumpy. Amen, Brittany? Because Brittany said, Dad, Dad, you're not, you're not as patient as you used to be. <laughs> Dad, you're getting grumpy in your old age. Well, I see... Listen, I don't have to worry about taking my shirt off and parading around in front of the ladies. I don't have to worry about that. Pietro does. I don't. <laughs> my dad always told me when I was younger, when you're around those ladies or you're playing basketball or you're away from it, I don't want you to take your shirt off. I'd say, Dad, every I said, keep it on. But Dad, we. I'm a guy. I'm not a woman. I don't keep it on. You know what I did? I kept it on. I tried to stretch those limits. I got a shirt one time and cut the hole underneath out. I come walking out. I'm going to go play basketball. He said, not with that on. I said, but dad, I could see both sides of you. Oh, come on, Dad. Go change it. In fact, give me that shirt. End of that shirt. My dad never let me step outside. 
You know what? I praise God today for a faithful father because I don't know what would have happened if I did all that. Maybe all these girls would have lost that. I fought it then. Do I fight it now? No. And if somebody saw my shirt, I'd be like, he's an old guy. <laughs> you ladies in here, what'd you fight when you were younger? Teenage years? You wanted to expose things, didn't you? Do you want to expose them now? Isn't it funny, older women, they keep things covered? What happens? What happens? It changes. Something changes physically. The age women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine. They might have a tendency to hit the hooch. They might. <laughs> Teachers of good things that they may teach the young women. You know why they could teach the young women? Because they've learned. They may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chast. See, chast behavior needs to be taught. We shouldn't teach our child, our young girls, to go out and parade themselves in things that aren't right and to wear things that aren't right. We should teach them to be chast. We should teach them to have good behavior. Teach them how to be keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. And I'll tell you this, fathers, if you can't get your daughter to listen to you, they're going to have trouble listening to who? You can save them from a lot of trouble later on if you can get them to listen to you as their father. They will understand. I will treat my husband like I treat my dad. The responsibilities with daughters doesn't always fall on the mother. Responsibilities for daughters oftentimes fall on the father. This is why society is so messed up. A girl that does not have a strong father does not have a father who will, who will lobby for her, who will protect her, who will help her, who will show her the right way. They have no defense against men, you understand? They get out there and they don't know the ways of men because their father wasn't there for them or didn't teach them. And they become very, very, very vulnerable to every man out there. It's passed down, folks. It's passed down. Chasteness and holiness, it's passed down. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech. Don't be a cusser. Young men have a tendency to want to cuss. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Okay, now it says down in verse number 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that what? Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live what? Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world and always having our eyes upward. Now. There is another passage that does deal with 1 Timothy chapter 2. And this deals with the relationship between men and women. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 8. And we're seeing in our world today a shift from men leadership to woman leadership. 
You see, what's happening in the world today is the world has shifted. They've shifted away from God's word. And because they've shifted away from God's word, they're open season for the devil. And the devil wants everybody to play a different role than God wants them to play. When the Lord said a woman should do this, the devil said, don't worry about what God says. Go do this. First Timothy chapter two and verse number eight. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also. So men are supposed to be praying. That women adorn themselves in modest apparel. With shamefacedness and sobriety. Not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Women have to be careful what they wear. It's got to be modest. It's got to be holy. Number 10, but which becometh women professing godliness. There's a certain standard that God expects with good works. Let the woman, the women, I'm sorry, let the, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to what? Usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And so therefore the devil will flip that around and have women leaders all over the place. Now, don't interpret this that I'm against any woman being in leadership or I'm against women going out and work because I'm not. I'm not. But you're seeing a major shift. Everybody running for office anymore is a woman. Our senators, our House of Representatives, our CEOs, it's just shifted so much to the point where women are totally in leadership. And that goes against the grain of the Bible occasionally here and there but to have them leading men that's not what god intended and surely god never intended a woman to be in the pulpit because you say well you're just a male chauvinist no there's a reason god did that and i'm going to close because i don't want to go too long and put everybody to sleep there's a reason god put the man in charge what is the reason because he liked men better what's the reason he did because it goes back to the beginning there were two Adam and Eve. Who did the devil go after? He went after the man indirectly, didn't he? But how did he get the man? Got him through the woman. She was deceived. Tricked. And she fell. And the man was stuck. Adam knew exactly what he was doing when he took that fruit. He knew it. He knew, I'm going to damn myself. But I'm going to do this. God doesn't tell us why she was away from Adam. God doesn't tell us why she was near that tree. But I'm sure it wasn't the first time. I'm sure she had frequented before. See, the devil waits to our weakest point, doesn't he? Then he pounces. And I'm going to say this for all you men who might be beating your chest and say, ha ha, we're the greater sex. God calls the woman the weaker vessel. Vessel. That doesn't mean the man is strong. We're weak. And we are vulnerable. That's why young men especially need to be in the attitude and posture of prayer. Are you newly married? Do you have little ones? 
The devil sure would love to destroy your home. He sure would love to do it. it takes a lot of prayer. And then sometimes you think they're all grown up and they're going to go away. And you're 18 and you can make your own decisions. They need you maybe more then than they ever did. And I can say that out of experience. We're going to pray. I hope you got a blessing on it tonight.